Thanks for having me, William. Uh, and it's such a privilege to be here with everyone. I, I agree with William. The future is very bright. Thank you to Brian for doing his homework uh, and speaking so eloquently. It was really inspiring to see. Uh, I've been asked to talk a little bit about why our community continues to be divided. Uh, I think the greatest challenge is, even though the notion of uh, the language of Asian American was erected about 51 to 52 years ago by students in the Bay Area, um, the reality is our identity is a constant one of becoming. It is a constant work in progress. Um, this has been furthered by the fact that we are not only the fastest growing immigrant population, as so many of us know, but also because of our geographic transients, increasingly because of economic mobility and opportunities. And uh, the younger generation finds itself to be a member of multiple nations as opposed to just one, like many of us historically. Uh, the other confounding factor here is that mixed race births in this country are now outpacing non-mixed race births and that growth is almost entirely coming from Asia and South America because of immigration rates. Uh, moreover, I think we all know some other sort of challenges our communities face. One is some of our citizens, some of us are citizens, others are undocumented. Um, and also we face this notion of the model minority myth that I think enough of us now know is highly problematic for, for largely two reasons. Um, the challenge, of course, is I think some of us are still very proud of this myth. We, after all, have the highest average income per household. We are the most educated population at the aggregate so forth and so on. But what this ignores is, is two or three factors. One, it ignores that we also have the widest income disparity of any community in this country. We actually have the bottom 10% of socioeconomic status. When you go to certain regions, especially, this pronounces itself. So for instance, 50% of Asian students in New York City actually grew up in poverty, which of course is different from the notion of the model minority myth. Finally is the model minority myth also sort of obfuscates our ability to ascend the highest echelons of society. This is most notably pronounced in technology and finance where we represent a disproportionately high percentage of the employee base relative to our 5.6, 5.8 percentage um, uh, demographic representation domestically. Uh, when you look at tech, for instance, we're about a third of the employee base, but we're half of executive ranks and single digits in the C-suite. I know a lot of us um, sort of forget that because we have so many incredible mostly South Asian executives and C-suiteers, um, whether it's Satya over at Microsoft or Sundar over at Alphabet. But again, the reality is by the numbers, we are still low. And finally, if you look at other factors like gender, uh, Harvard Business Review, everyone's former favorite university, actually articulated that women and Asian women are the least likely to get promoted in corporate management. Now, I don't know why anyone would post a study like this, but um, the, the fact remains that we have to support not only our race, but we also have to support women, period, and, and particularly from the systemic bias that they have felt in corporations in that case. Um, now, why has this actually come to be? Why are we still so divided? Well, the, the, the short answer is we don't have a biological or sort of genetic tie. We have 50 different ethnicities. We have hundreds of dialects. We have no central historic struggle. We also have no single, central single political issue. For most of us, we're actually split down the middle on most causes. We have no regular convening grounds. So we don't have church that we all go to or, or temple that we all go to every week. And finally, we're also distributed across the world. Uh, my favorite fun fact is that the largest diaspora of Japanese uh, folks outside of Japan is actually, of course, in Brazil. Um, and so our fracturing across the sort of globe, whether it's genetically or geographically and so forth, has prevented this convening. Moreover, you also see persistent implicit bias within the Asian community. So there's still an inexplicable rift between East and South Asians. Moreover, the Filipino community, which is the second largest Asian ethnicity in this country and the first documented Asians to be in this country in the 1580s, they're known as uh, the Luzonians, uh, are also often omitted from these conversations. So then the question becomes, well, what can unite us? Where can we actually begin? And I think there are two places. Uh, one is, I want to echo what Sanjay said earlier, we have an imperative to vote. And more importantly, one could argue, we have an imperative to fill out the census. Uh, the census controls, you know, a gazillions amount of dollars. Uh, I believe the average impact per citizen is roughly about twenty-five dollars to $30,000 each, but that will necessarily impact all the ways that we are able to live in society. And Asians are not only the least likely to vote, we are also the least likely to fill out the census. So that's something practical that I agree with Sanjay, we, we have to sort of begin doing. I think the second piece that we have to think about is even if we don't care about our race or others, the reality is that the world runs on one race and that race is green and it is known as money. And, and this sounds tacky and like a very Asian thing to say, but, but it's not wrong. It is the pragmatic approach. Um, I've been particularly, um, I don't even know the right adjective. I, I've, been, I've been particularly upset, I suppose, most recently and, and, and sad at how many of our small, medium-sized businesses are literally dying right now. 
It was already because of COVID and now it's become and even worse because of looters. And there's been all sorts of data, one for instance from the Center for Responsible Lending that indicated that 75 plus percent of Asian owned businesses and 91 plus percent of native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander owned businesses have quote, no chance of receiving a PPP loan from a mainstream bank or credit union because of a lack of a previous relationship. And this again become, is part of sort of societal structural bias. That necessarily means these businesses are are going to go under. And that's not something that I want to see. I, I think all of us, you know, find the essential value of Asian owned businesses, uh, particularly the 3 million that we founded over the past few years. And so something simple that all of us can do is whether you're buying food, whether you're buying garments, or whatever have you, especially in this period, to go out of your way to find not only Asian, but minority owned businesses that we can support. And then finally, is, as everyone has said today, and I think was one of the impetuses of this great forum, is the plight of other communities in so many ways is much graver than ours. Having acid thrown in your face is terrible, especially as an elder and innocent, and as someone who's innocent. But being, being suffocated on the street by a police officer and dying is admittedly and decidedly worse. And so we have a responsibility as a fellow minority and as fellow human beings to speak up, not only for the black community, but for the Latinx community, for, for the Islamic community, for the LGBTQ community and so forth. Because a single hit against any minority, we must not forget, is necessarily a permissive hit against all of us. Thanks again for, excuse me, thanks again for having me.